There once was a place called the Folie Bergère, where everyone smiled and flirted and stared, except for a barmaid who shared with her eyes a look more mystifying than the trapeze artist hanging from the skies. We're facing a bar at the Folie Bergère in Paris. It's 1882, one year before the death of the artist Edouard Manet. It's a busy night and a gloomy barmaid is awaiting her next customer, which is us. Who's this standing behind her? It must be her, since the background is actually just a giant mirror. But she looks so different. Well, she's talking to a man right now, so we'll have to wait our turn. But where is he? Why is he not in front of us? Are we the man? This piece, called A Bar at the Folie Bergère, is considered one of the most puzzling works of all time. The Folie Bergère was a popular music hall in Paris, and Manet frequently went there to make sketches. The entertainment spot showcased anything from ballets to circus acts and everything in between, including the less discussed attraction of the barmaids that were well known to sell themselves as well as drinks. Writer Guy de Maupassant described them as vendors of drink and love. While Manet kept the barmaid anonymous when he exhibited this piece at the Paris Salon in 1882, we now know her name is Suzanne. She leans against a marble bar decorated with an assortment of wine, beer, liquor, and oranges. A bar separates her from us and us from her. Her hands clutch the counter like it's the only thing keeping her steady in this chaotic room. She looks eerily similar to the objects she stands alongside. Her black dress matches the black bottles. Her jewelry echoes the gold foil. The flowers in the vase hint at the flowers on her chest, and so on. It's as if she's an object of consumption, just like everything else. But her gaze is so painfully human. Although she faces us, her eyes just miss ours, adding another layer of separation. One could perceive many different emotions from her ambiguous expression. Is she sad? Tired? Bored? Withdrawn? Daydreaming? All of the above, or nothing at all? A man appears in the mirror to her right. Some have even speculated this is Manet. He seems intense, anticipatory, and claustrophobically close. What does he want? A drink? Some company for the night? But is this even the same woman? She appears so much more engaged in the reflection than the woman standing before us. And the angle of interaction is unrealistically off-center. Maybe Suzanne is imagining it happening. French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty once said, the mirror is the instrument of a universal magic that changes things into spectacles, spectacles into things, me into others, and others into me. Indeed, when we look at the mirror in the background, we see what Suzanne is seeing. Couples interact, people laugh and drink under bright lights and a glittering chandelier. There's a woman holding binoculars, which illustrates the see and be seen atmosphere. Perhaps she's checking who's sitting together, what they're wearing, and how they're behaving. Manet took a contrarian approach to art. He was known to capture the day-to-day -day activities of the bourgeois, but unlike most of his impressionist contemporaries, he often portrayed his subjects in a way that challenged the societal stereotypes imposed on them. A mother may be lost in thought rather than behaving caringly toward her daughter. A couple may look indifferent to one another rather than sharing a loving gaze. This avant-garde style is best seen in his depictions of women. He was challenged to present and new to the salon and gave them Olympia, the subject who was a real woman, flaws and all, and was also an escort. And while many middle and upper class men were willing to ask for services from such a woman, they couldn't bear to confront her looking so unabashedly confident on the floor of an art exhibition. <coughs> the salon was forced to hang the painting high on the wall to prevent vandalism. Critic John Berger once said, A woman in the culture of privileged Europeans is first and foremost a sight to be looked at. Her nakedness is not an expression of her own active feelings. It's a sign of her submission. 
The woman in Monet's luncheon in the grass couldn't challenge this sentiment more as she sits confidently with nothing on beside two completely clothed men. She exists only for herself and is anything but submissive. This piece was outright rejected by the salon in 1863. Manet beautifully captures these moments in between, the flashes in time when people break from their roles and you catch a glimpse of their authentic selves. Critics accused Manet of rushing to finish a bar at the Folie Bergère, saying that must have been what caused the blatant errors in perspective. But this is unlikely to be true because Manet completed many studies of the piece on location and then completed the final painting in his studio. Here is a study of the painting. If you compare it to the final work, it looks almost entirely different. Suzanne is turned to the side, her arms crossed instead of open. Her hairstyle is much fancier. Perspective has been altered significantly in the final painting, but many believe this was a deliberate choice on Manet's part. If you look at x-ray images of the final painting, you'll notice that he shifted the woman's reflection to the right a few times. Her arms originally crossed. The man has also been made larger and higher in the shot. But why would Manet purposefully alter reality in this way? Well, maybe he didn't. In an attempt to solve these spatial and optical conundrums, art scholar Malcolm Park set out to recreate this iconic scene in a 2000 study. He put together a successful reenactment with a viewpoint just to the right of the bar. This shows where Manet would have been positioned to paint the piece, though he cut off much of the surroundings. This would explain why the man is out of frame but present in the mirror. It also suggests that the man is really to the left of the woman, and the conversation between them is nothing more than an optical trick. In fact, he's looking away from her. Although Suzanne appears to be standing parallel to the bar, she's actually rotated slightly to face the viewer and away from the man. And in the recreation, she appears more engaged in the mirror than in real life, just like the painting. According to this theory, the biggest alteration of reality appears to be the edge of the bar, which is angled higher in the painting than it would have been in real life. It seems plausible that Manet did this to create a vanishing point behind the woman's head, drawing your eye to her expression. If this is true, it means that no one in this massive room full of people is even looking at Suzanne. Which is ironic as the viewer because she's front and center and the focus of the piece. In addition, Manet chose to leave her nameless and make the title A Bar at the Folie Bergère all about the setting rather than the subject. And the only person who seems to notice her is actually not looking at her at all, as if she's completely alone in a room full of people. But we see her and recognize her face as if it has traveled through time and space. In our own reflections, we notice her eyes, but they are our own. And it's no surprise, though our lives seem so different and so much has changed, we're met with a world that still feels the same. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.